Today is Tuesday, August 1st, 2017. My name is Mark DePue. I'm the Director of Oral History at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. And I'm excited to have you, Maybelle, sitting across me today. Maybelle Blair, how are you this afternoon? Oh Maybelle? gosh, I'm so wonderful, you just cannot believe it. <laughs> I'm overjoyed because we had a great uh, baseball uh, tournament here at Rockford, Illinois for 209 girls. And we were so thrilled about it. It turned out so wonderful. Baseball, not softball, right? It is baseball. Thank you for reminding everybody we're playing baseball, not softball. And we are we have the fortune, the good fortune of being at the Midway Village Museum. They have been very gracious hosts for us to, to do these interviews here. And you can see the backdrop here. We got the league of their own. We'll get to that, but towards the end of our interview. Oh, maybe. I hope so. And then one of the players, and a good idea what the uniforms look like in the, in the day. But tell me about that bat that's next to you. Oh, my gosh. I'm so proud of this Better bat. Better pick that bat up for yeah, us. Yeah. A friend of mine, Donna Cohen, who is our lawyer for our organization, the IWBC, uh, got this for me. And I'm so thrilled that she got this uh, on this bat. I have all the movie stars that was in the League of Their Own. Sandy Koufax, as everybody knows who Sandy Koufax is. And Sharon Robinson, Jackie Robinson's daughter. We have uh, Kim Ng, one of the first women that ever was in Major League Baseball as an executive. She's vice president. I have uh, some uh, Hall of Fame uh, baseball players. And uh, our uh, and many more. I can go on. Billy Bean, who is vice president of uh, Major League Baseball, and uh, so many more, so many more. And if there's somebody like me who asks a, an off-color question, you can just kind of take care of that with you. Oh, you better believe it. I'll straighten you out in a hurry <laughs> if anybody does. I can still swing this bat, you know. I bet you can. You bet I can. Well, let's start with uh, when and where you were born. Okay, I was born in Redondo Beach, California um, <clears throat> in the year of 1927. So that makes me 90 years old now. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, You're I made it. 90. Oh, yeah, I'm this side of the dirt. That's what counts. And I understand it was January of January 16th. Okay. Well, I'd like to find out about the family background because I think that's important figuring out who you are. So tell me about your father. Let's start with him. Okay, my father was uh, born in Texas, same as my mother. And uh, they were, uh, my father was a cowboy. And my mother naturally was the home raising the children. And um, what's a cowboy doing out in Redondo? No, this was in Texas. Yeah, That's where I was born in, in Redondo. My okay. father and mother were born in Texas. What did he do in uh, California then? Well, uh, after they couldn't make it in Texas, the Blair family all moved to Redondo Beach. And um, my father, uh, we were very, very poor. And uh, just eked out a living, a job here and a job there, and we survived. Thank God for them. We had a cow, and we, my mother and father would raise vegetables and chickens and, and um, rabbits, and we made out like bandit as far as food goes. But I can remember as a child, my mother borrowing half a loaf of bread from our next door neighbor to make my dad's sandwich to be able to go work for the day. He'd work all day long for a dollar a day quarrying rock upon Palos Verdes Hills in California. Hard work. Hard work. And your, your comments about California in those days, you're growing up in the midst of the Great Depression. Yes. And you know, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm seeing Henry Fonda and the Joad family going out from Oklahoma out to California. And can, even when they got there, it wasn't necessarily the wonderful It place was they not thought. that wonderful. Um, I can remember when I was a child that it was Easter time. And uh, some of the kids I knew, uh, a couple of them had a little bit more money in their family than we did. And I was crying because I wanted an Easter egg or something. And my mother says, well, honey, we just don't have the money. But she had a dime in her purse. 
all we had. And she went and bought me that and it brings tears to my eyes today to realize she went and spent that so I could have my egg. The last dime in the family, huh? You betcha. Do you have some brothers and sisters? I had uh, one brother who was uh, seven years older than me, and uh, I had three siblings that were younger than me that died uh, before I was born, and uh, the two of us remained. Hmm. Well, again, that kind of illustrates how hard, hard times were at that time. Yes, one died of diphtheria, one died of smallpox, and one died of uh, infantile paralysis. My other brother had infantile paralysis also, but fortunately he didn't die at the time. Okay, tell me, how would you describe your dad's personality? My dad was quite a wonderful guy. And uh, he worked his rear end off to support his family and love his family. He didn't have much of an education. I think he went probably to about the fifth grade if he is that lucky. And uh, what he, his one passion was he loved baseball. In fact, his whole family, baseball. He had um, seven brothers and a couple, three cousins, and they had what is known as the Blair Nine. And they played uh, all over Texas when they were very young, traveling team. And uh, our whole family is uh, very sports-minded. Uh, if you didn't like baseball, you were almost out of the uh, family, but uh, that's the way it was. Did your dad had dreams about becoming a pro baseball player? Oh, yes, but you know, again, during the war, of World War I, people had to stay home and uh, work the farms or, you know, go. go. But my father, uh, I would say then, was fortunate that he didn't have to, but his brothers did, but they kept some at home to be able to work the farm. And that's what happened. Okay, how about your mother? What was her maiden name? Uh, Patterson, she was, a, she was a part uh, Irish and part Indian. And uh, she, it's quite a gal. She told me that she is the best girl athlete in, in, the, in the county of Hamilton, Texas. And I believed her because <laughs> my mother could do everything, everything. And they were all baseball-minded. So I came from a baseball mind at her side of the family. What was her first name? Iva. Her middle name was Iva or a Blair. And she rode uh, horseback, side saddle. Hmm. And she told me all about that, how she could run that horse. You have a great baseball name. I mean, Maybell Blair. That just kind of rolls off the tongue. Oh, you know? gosh, yeah. A lot of people uh, today, uh, which isn't true, Call me all the way May. Everywhere I go, for, from the movie, uh, Madonna, they called her all the way May. Well, they call me, because, I'm assuming because my name is May Bell, and I am sort of a rival. Uh, I uh, do things that uh, some of the other girls don't do, like, well, a lot of us do, though. We have a few beers here and there. But uh, we had a ball, absolute ball. But that's the way it was. How would you describe your mom's personality? Outgoing. My mother had the most outgoing personality, and when she laughed, you could hear her from three blocks down the road. She laughed from their bottom to clear to her top, and there's a no nothing my mother couldn't do. She made all my brother's clothes, all my clothes. She could do electrical, she could do plumbing. My mother, you mentioned it, she could do it. Okay, Maybell, here's the, the tough question. Which one of these two do you take after? I look like my father, and uh, I think personality-wise I'd go my mother. I have been led to believe that you are not shy and retiring. That's what they tell me, but I, <laughs> I don't know. But I, you know, I always think that uh, uh, if you can't have a good time or go anywhere and not have a good time, for God's sake, stay home. And, uh, and make everybody else happy. That's my philosophy. You gotta make everybody miserable, stay home. And you haven't stayed home much in your I life. have not stayed home too much and I'm not planning on it. And thank God I'm still capable of getting around. I wonder if you can, uh, I want to go back to your days growing up and it sounds like it was hard times. Did you feel growing up like you were disadvantaged in any way? No, I didn't know the difference because, Mark, we had so much love in our family. 
so much love in our family. I didn't know the difference. My mother would go and buy uh, uh, feed for our chickens and all that. And th in those days, they had these beautiful prints on the feed sacks. My mother would take those feed sacks and make me a little dress, and I had little matching pants to match my dress. And all the girls were actually jealous of my little dress and everything. And my mama said, honey, as long as you keep your shoes polished and, um, and keep your hair clean and look at everything, you're just as good as anybody else. I had the cleanest shoes, Mark, that you ever saw, <laughs> but I had the holes in the bottom of them this big, but I had the best cardboard in them so that I could wear to school. And I was so proud because my shoes were shining. That's what counted. Did you uh, have a few chores at home? Oh, Mother, we always had a few chores. But the main thing in my mother's life was to not put her kids what she had to do. So when there was the kids were out practicing ball or the neighborhood's kids were all out playing, you get out there and play, Mayval. You get out there and play. I didn't have that opportunity. I want you to get out there and play. So off, naturally, I didn't argue with her. I'd grab my mitt and off I was out there playing when I was about four years old. But uh, no, uh, she didn't make us do chores as such, but we did help. Now you said both your parents are really into baseball. Yes. And it sounds like that's what the kids in the neighborhood were playing too. Well, we didn't have any other games to play. All we had was a bat and a ball. We didn't have a football or a soccer ball. We had baseball that's covered mostly with uh, duct tape to keep it apart, but we had a bat. So we was able to play. An honest to God bat, not just the sticks that somebody No, saw? it was actually a bat. We were very proud of that bat. And everybody uh, always wanted to Blair, borrow the Blair's bat when they decided to have a little, if their family came over or something. Can we borrow your bat, Mabel, or Tommy? And, yeah, we'll let you borrow our bat. You had your own mitt, though, sounds Oh, like. yes, I had my own mitt. My mother seen to me that I had my own mitt, and it was so wonderful. And that's an illustration of how important sports were to both your parents. Yes, that's true. I can remember her going out and selling eggs and taking in ironing so we could get in the Model T Ford and drive down to 42nd and Avalon. That's where the Los Angeles Angels had their uh, team. It was a triple-A team, which is affiliated with the Chicago Cubs. That time, all we had, you know, was the radio. And the Cubbies, the only one we could hear would, would be the Cubbies, so I guess on account of the Angels. I don't know. I don't realize now. But uh, that was our team. But we got to go to the ball game once a week. My mother saw to it that we could drive that old Model T Ford and get down to that one ball game. We had the cheapest seats in the house, but we were inside that ballpark. We couldn't have a hot dog or anything, but we were inside the ballpark. I can remember walking alongside Wrigley Field there and smell the aroma of the hot dogs. It made me feel so good. I was at Wrigley Field. That was like eating the hot dog. It was just the smell of it. This is Wrigley Field out in California. Yes, it was a little, it was on 42nd Street. It was just like a miniature little Wrigley Field. And, and then when the teams all moved out here, um, uh, uh, Gene Autry bought the Los Angeles Angels with, I think it was, uh, it was two or three other guys. I can't write, I got a senior moment right now. But anyway, he bought that. And then we, then they tore down a little Wrigley Field and we went to um, uh, the Coliseum. That was the Dodgers, Maybell. Uh, we went to the Coliseum, but the Angels then went to Anaheim and built their stadium from Little Wrigley Field. But that was long after, well, maybe it wasn't so much longer after we're talking about The Dodgers, about. yeah. The Dodgers moved out there what year? Do you oh, remember? Oh, God, I don't remember. I, and there, I don't remember. Did you become a Dodgers fan? As soon oh, as yeah. My gosh, I was sitting in that Coliseum, and I was very fortunate. I was a little older then and working, and um, Wally Moon shot over the left field field there at the Coliseum. I saw that, Duke Snyder and all of them. It was wonderful. You gave up on the Cubs after the Dodgers? Oh, no, moved. I'll always be a Cubby fan because it, it was a root of my life was uh, the Chicago Cubs. And then as I got older, and, and nowadays, uh, my favorite team 
is the uh, Boston Red Sox because they have helped out to girls baseball so much and has started the fantasy camp down in uh, Florida. And it has helped girls baseball so much that uh, I'll never forget it. When you were going to these games, how much did it cost? Oh, gosh, you would ask. At that time, I probably could get into the um, Angels probably, I'm guessing for, a, I don't know, a quarter maybe, maybe a dollar something for my parents. Or, you know, we would sit again, out. That's another sacrifice your parents are making. To oh, get they the did. Game. They sacrificed themselves. Uh, they could have bought themselves things, but they sacrificed for their children to be able to take them to the ball games because they wanted us to be entrenched in baseball. When you were playing games in the neighborhood, I assume this is just pickup games, um, was it both boys and girls that were playing the games? Oh, yes. Uh huh. And uh, older uh, than me. Um, uh, yeah, I was probably only the two of us girls were on the, uh, the rest of them were boys because that's what we mostly had in the neighborhood. Could you hold boys. your own with those boys? <laughs> no. You know, my, my brother um, and father, we built our own baseball diamond We out in the, the time in California. There wasn't anything around, you know, not like it is today, God Almighty. We had a field right across the street from our home. So we decided, or my, I, not we, my father, my brother, and my dad's brother decided we're going to make a baseball field out of it. Well, anyway, they did, and uh, all the neighbor guys got together in the next neighborhood, and they would play each other, you know, games, and we had a ball. As a little kid, I can remember all these games with all the neighbors around in different territories, maybe two miles away or one mile away. We had these games, and then it was my brother, uh, later on, after... He grew up a little more. It was him to keep the diamond smooth. So we got an old gate or it was a bed mattress or something. And uh, he'd say, hop on, sis. He says, I got to go drag the field. And my God, I'd come back black as the ace of spades <laughs> with all that dirt and everything. I, he might have killed me out there. And I got to think about it today. And I was just so happy I was helping uh, drag that field. I held that mattress or, or spring spring box springs I guess you call it down or it was a gate I can't remember which but that was my duty. Maybell you had your own field of dreams out there. We did we had the Blair field of dreams right there in front of our house. Was your brother dreaming of the days he could oh, play pro ball? Oh my gosh yes are you kidding it was so wonderful uh, well naturally I idolized my brother because I thought he was the greatest ball player that ever lived you know naturally and he was seven years older than I. And um, all the boys in the neighborhood go out and have batting practice. And other kids, young men like him at the time, would come out from the other districts and all practice in our field. Well, May at Maybell, you go in and sit at the radio and keep score. Because he was getting the Cubbies games and I'd have to keep score. And the only time I got to go out and play was when it was batting practice for the guys. So I'd be the shag. I had to go shag those balls, thrilled to death to go shag the balls. And maybe if batting practice came around, maybe I'd get hit about five or 10 times. Then it's time to quit. You got plenty of exercise running down the balls. I oh bet. my gosh, yes. Boy, I was the most popular thing in the world with all the guys when it was time for batting practice. Did they, they all kind of look took care of you when you're out there? Oh yeah, they, they, real great. My brother thought he was gonna be the greatest pitcher that God ever made. So he taught me to catch and I caught him, uh, my father and we'd all get out there and it's a wonder I wasn't killed as a kid. I wasn't any higher in that microphone there. And uh, he'd pitch, you know, as hard as he could throw. And I was just a little thing, I had to stand up there. My father says, stay. Hang in there, sis, hang in there, and he'd catch my brother. It's what I, got, I think about it today, I think, my God, he's throwing curves and everything else. <laughs> it was fun. I enjoyed it. I didn't know the difference. How far did your brother make it in baseball? Okay, well, my brother was just about ready to sign with the Los Angeles Angels farm team. The war hit. Here we World go War again. II. World War II. Well, my brother goes off, and... Um, Luckily, I should say that uh, he was out, um, uh, let's see now how that happened. 
Oh, they, uh, they said that my brother couldn't go because he had infantile paralysis. Uh, but it didn't affect him physically, but his stomach. So he says, I want to go. And he didn't tell the people that he had infantile paralysis or he had stayed home. But he thought it was his duty to go. So he went and uh, he went out on the marches and all of that. And he couldn't make them. He started throwing up and what have you. And they says, well, what's wrong? They took him to the hospital and they found out that he had infantile paralysis when he was a kid. And they says, well, you cannot go overseas and cause a problem. So anyway, they kept him home and he became, um, finally, they said he should go, you know, get him out of the service. He said, no, I don't want to get out of the service. I want to help. So anyway, they kept him in the service and he, as a recreation director, I think, and he went to Fork Riley, Kansas, and he won the championship baseball team because he also played on the team. And uh, while he was at Fort uh, Riley, Kansas, uh, I, I can't remember how it happened, threw up his hand or something, the sun was in his eye and shattered his arm. And he couldn't play anymore. That ended his baseball career. And it just about broke the whole family's heart, naturally. At that time, were you thinking, you know, maybe I can be the one who plays bass? No, didn't even dream of such a thing, because um, there wasn't it, there wasn't anything for girls at that time. There's two positions in life for girls, and that was to be a school teacher or a nurse. So you had to be either either one, and uh, that was it. I want to ask you some more questions about World War II because it's it's such an important part of American oh, history. Oh, absolutely. You remember. Uh, the day they bombed Pearl Harbor, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Oh yes, I can remember exactly what that was. I was sitting at our table in, uh, at home and we heard it over the radio. The um, girl Pearl Harbor, the family just come unglued, you know, naturally like all Americans did. What now, you know, what's gonna happen? Well, one of my uncles uh, was already in the service and he was over in the Philippines, and he was in the death march. And um, he told me stories about that death march that you cannot believe, and how they transport him in this small ship in the hole, he called it, I guess. And there wasn't much room, I guess, around this building, and I don't know how many hundreds of men was in there. They had one slop jar, he said, about five gallons, and that was for everything they were laying in all the way to Japan and all that. And he says it's the most horrible thing and when they die they just roll them over and put them in the corner. Yeah, I just finished a book uh, about Ben Steele that was all about that experience. It was Tears terrible. in the Darkness, I think was the name. Oh, oh really? Yeah, and it's, it was one of the hardest books I've ever read because of the horrific treatment mm -hmm. that they got. And he, t he sit down and tears just rolls down your face every time he'd tell us these stories, you know, and it was such it's terrible. And when he was a prisoner there, and then when they liberate him, he says when they heard the roar of the airplanes and they looked up and saw all this stuff coming, he says the Japanese just spread and then he ran out and this bucket of um, pineapple juice hit the ground and it started rolling. It was like on a little hill and it broke. He said, I laid under that Maybell and the just that pineapple juice just rushed right it all over my face and I was drinking it as fast as I could. He's ate, he ate rats and cats and killed the company cat and they accused him and they broke a shovel over his back and it, it, he could tell stories that I can't still believe to this day. Did the family know that he had been taken prisoner during the war? Yes, we did. Um, and then they, the Japanese interviewed, you know, and you're supposed to say certain things over the radio and all that. And he said, oh yeah, Murder's Horde, da da da, and all this. And he says, I would just love to sit down and eat with Turk again. And that was his dog. We could tell what was going on. But the Japanese didn't know what he was talking no. about. Amazing. What was, how would you describe the mood of the country when you, you were still a young girl during yes. World War II? How would you describe the mood of the country at that time? The mood of the country was that we were all one and uh, we were going to get through this thing and it was the love of each other. It, it, 
people came to be all family instead of your own family. And during those days, we were more families than they are today because in those days, well, here I'm going to, maybe I don't want to get political or anything, but uh, they had, people went to church and it was family. And uh, we stayed families. It wasn't this against you or I'm going to do this. And the school teachers and the police and the families had control over their children. You know, uh, my mother told me when we went out, I was to be seen and not heard. And I believed every word she told me. So when I'd go visiting, I'd sit on the couch until I was told or ask a question. And then We're I was, talking about was somebody there. who's not shy either. That wasn't shy. That's why she told me all this. So I believed her <laughs> because I got two lickings in my life and that was all I wanted to remember. <laughs> and I, I remembered it. And that's what's lacking today, I do believe, is a little more discipline at home. Who gave you the lickings? My mother, not my father. She was, was a disciplinarian. Yes, well, I could tell you about wood licking. It was, I'll never forget it. My mother had a remedy for everything. That was castor oil. You had a headache. You had a, a toe ache. You had a stomach ache. It was castor oil. We didn't have the pills in it. It was castor oil. So it was this one day, I guess I might get in the sniffles or something. I don't know. So it was time to take that. Ca oh my God, I hated castor oil. Hated it with a purple passion. Little Maybell decides she's not going to take this castor oil. Around this family table we went, around and around. She grabbed my little old leg, and I'll tell you, I took that castor oil, and the next time I had a sickness and the remedy came up with castor oil, my little mouth flew open <laughs> because I knew what I'd get if I didn't. <laughs> and, but and I do believe this should be... She didn't kill me, for God's sakes. Uh, it was just probably a couple of spats with my dad's razor, razor strap, but she didn't kill me. She wasn't fixing to. She had already lost three kids. She wasn't going to lose me. Were you a, a daddy's girl growing up? Oh, yeah. Well, my dad thought I was the greatest ball player of the whole, whole Blair family of all of the girls and half of the boys. So what my daughter, he, oh, he was so proud of my athletic ability. Does that make you a, a tomboy growing up as well? I was a tomboy. Yes, I was. And proud of it? And I was proud of it. And to this day, I'm still proud to be a tomboy and um, part of it, you know. And uh, it, it gave me a sense of um, self-assurance. Um, and I think this is what a lot of our girls need today is to have more confidence in themselves because their parents hasn't bestowed that in them. Oh, you go out, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, if you make up your mind, Mark, to do something, you can do it. And this is what I'm preaching to these young girls in um, baseball today, like we had 208 of them out here. If you want to be a ball player, keep dreaming, because we're going to make this come true for you. And if you can't make it in baseball, be a, a, an executive someplace, be a proud of yourself, you know you can do it. In other words, get themselves out there, stretch their limits. Exactly. Go out there and show your strong points. And if you're weak at something, go develop it. We can do it if we all work together. I want to ask you a couple more questions about the World War II era. Do you remember the day Franklin Roosevelt died? That was oh. the only president you knew, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I can remember when Hoover went out of office. I remember that. Oh, you were an awful, that was maybe well, went, four or five at the time. I was, uh, let's see, how old was I? 27, three. I was five years old, but I remember it. Because I can remember him saying there'd be a chicken in every pot, you know? And what else was it? Chicken in every pot, that was it. And my mother kept repeating it, and because we were poor. and. Uh, Anyway, then Roosevelt ran and won, and I know my mother voted for uh, President uh, Roosevelt, and uh, we had him until he died, I think, in what, 46 or 47 he, he around He died in April there? 45, right 45, before the end of the war. Right. And I can remember when, and then Harry, bless his heart, came on, and uh, he and Amy, uh, his, what was her name? Oh. Oh, his daughter, oh my God, he loved his daughter. Yeah. 
She thought she could Beth. sing. Beth. No, that was his wife. That was his wife. Margaret. Margaret. Now you're right. Yeah, Margaret. He thought Margaret was the greatest thing on shoe leather. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad every father thinks that, you know. <laughs> Your father thought the world was you. That's right. My father thought there was never another Maybell. You remember uh, the celebration at the end of World War II? Oh, my gosh. Yes, I do. I was, uh, yeah, a teenager, and uh, I can remember... Um, Oh, it was terrible. It was wonderful. You have never seen anything like it. I went, somehow I wound up downtown Los Angeles. I can't remember why. And everybody was screaming and hollering and celebration that you wouldn't believe. Guns shooting in the air, noises, uh, screaming, hollering, crying with joy. Uh, it was everything. Maybell, did you get kissed that day? You better believe I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so happy the sailors is around, you know, and they're just kissing me all over the place. I was just like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> I like that, Mark. You're so right. Okay. Let's get to the main part of our story then. Okay. Because it's about the All-American Girls Professional oh, Baseball League. Yes. Day. And it started during World War II. Absolutely. Did you know anything about it during the Did war? Did not know anything about it until the scouts came out. And that was a couple years after the war. From what, it, well, we have 42, we have 45, around 45, ended, 46. Well, the war ended in 45, know. and as well, I understand, your first year. 47. It was 47. 48. Well, 48. I saw in the, the internet says it, it was 1948. 48. Yeah, 48. When did you graduate from high school? At 44. Okay. What did you do between 1944 and when the scouts showed up? I was uh, going to uh, college, uh, Compton Junior College, and uh, golly, I don't know. Well, I know what I was also doing. I was working at the aircraft factory. They've hired me, uh, they hired a lot of kids during that period to go in and help. Well, they put me in public relations, and that's what I loved, you know. Well, I, I, got to work, I got to work for the public relations boss, and he, he was so precious. He just took me under his arm and treated me like his own daughter, you know, and I was very, I was very fortunate. I worked for Northrop Aircraft. Okay. I didn't ask you this, but when you were in high school, did you have an opportunity to play any sports? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, high school stuff, and I played on local softball teams uh, uh, like that. And fortunate in uh, high school, I was nominated as the best athlete, girl athlete of the school. And I understood that there wasn't a lot of opportunities for girls in high school at the time. No, there wasn't. Uh, we didn't... Uh, uh, you know, how many leagues? We had industrial leagues and the little uh, town leagues, um, softball leagues. And the local sweet shop would buy us a t-shirt and, and little towns around the neighborhood like Inglewood, Hawthorne, uh, Elsie Gundle. These were the teams, they had little teams and we'd travel over their little field and play a little game of softball. Now when you were playing across the street at the Blair Field, Sounds like you were playing honest-to-God baseball. Baseball, there. yes. But now you're talking about softball. Softball. Yeah, I played baseball then, but then softball with the little girls, you know, us girls playing different towns, yes, softball. So you did get to travel around playing softball? Well, just about five miles, you know, around. But I did, um, during the war, I uh, was playing softball for a team by the name of the Pasadena Ramblers, and uh, that team was strictly, uh, they put together, we traveled all over uh, Southern California, went to, uh, I, just think, I never forgot about this. We played the Army bases and Navy bases and Marine bases. I played at Cap Pendleton, uh, Corona, uh, uh, some more places, I forgot the names of them, that we'd go play against the soldiers and the sailors and all of this, the girls' women's softball team, yes. So your girls' high softball school. team were playing against guys? Guys. Well, what was that experience like? It was wonderful. Yeah, we could beat them. They'd be <laughs> the sailors and all of them would get a team and then they would take us to the mess hall and feed us and show us a good time and maybe they'd take us to the rec hall and uh, 
have a little music. We had chaperones with us and uh, dance and play around. It was fun. We'd take, they'd, uh, pay our expenses with buses, you know, pick us up at uh, Pasadena and haul us down to all these different places. In fact, uh, before the war was over, they were going to uh, take us overseas and uh, play the teams over in the, on the uh, Pacific side. Uh, let me think now. And uh, we were just about ready to go, then they decided it was too dangerous. And they changed their minds. It was very they probably close. made the right decision. Probably did. Uh, I got all kinds of questions. And when you start talking about this, what position were you playing? Second base. Okay. Did you ever had any experience pitching as well? Oh, not softball. No. Okay. Is that the position you love to play? Is that your natural position? You think? I was uh, a very good second baseman, but I had one hell of a good arm. I, excuse me, a very good arm. Yeah. And uh, so in baseball, he saw that my arm was good. And uh, I, like I told you, my brother wanted to be a pitcher, so therefore, little Maybell wanted to be a pitcher. So he taught me how to throw the curve and the uh, knuckleball and fastball. But uh, he thought that his sister was the greatest thing on two legs, <laughs> except when he would decide to go someplace and I wanted to follow him and he'd make me stay home, you know, that really hurt. Well, I imagine if you're wanting to go on dates with him, that wouldn't work too well. <laughs> that did not work. <laughs> what'd you think about, yeah, what'd you think about the, the underhand pitching in softball? Oh, what, what do you mean? What did I think well, about? I'm, I guess I'm trying to get the distinction between softball and baseball, and that's one of the obvious differences. Well, there's a very obvious difference. Uh, the ball is bigger. Bases are shorter. Uh, to me, baseball is easier than softball due to the fact it is small. Bases are longer, naturally, but you can the ball's smaller, you can catch it better, you can throw it better, your hands are fit this uh, baseball better. To me, I like, well, I grew up baseball, so. so that was your game? That was my game. Okay. And when you finished in high school, it sounds like you didn't want to be a teacher. No. You didn't want to be a nurse. What did you think you wanted to do? Tell you the truth, I really didn't know. Uh, I was leaning towards possibly, uh, I, I guess the best leading I had was being a gym teacher, but I really basically didn't want to. I wanted to get in uh, baseball some way, and, and, and I, you know, we, I was so confused, I didn't know what I was doing. And then an opportunity... The opportunity arose. Okay, tell us that story. So here we go. So I was out playing softball, and the scout saw me, and, and um, so he took me, I told him there's no way, you know, that my mother let me go. I think I told you the story, but anyway, he followed me home. And my mother was a dominant one in my family as far as making decisions and what have you. Of course, my father naturally had kicked me out of the house to go play baseball. Anyway, my mother said, no, 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 she's not leaving. And um, finally he got around mentioning salary and he says, well, I'm going to pay her $55 a week. My mother looked over at my father and said, go crank up that car. I'm packing her suitcase. <laughs> this was kidding, of course. And out the door, she, she's going. So $55 was more than my father was making. So they thought I was going to send more money home to them uh, to help support the family. You know, well, naturally, that was my plan, too. But I was a sort of a maverick when I was playing ball, and I'd always get fined because it um, had to be a certain time, bedtime check, and I, I always liked to have fun, you know what I mean? Uh, that's why they call me May, <laughs> all the way May. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I like to have fun and um, do things that other people wouldn't do, like our second baseman twice, Shiley, she broke her leg. So it was at a Catholic hospital there in Peoria where they took her. I don't even remember the name of the hospital. I think she's on the second floor, if not mistaken. Anyway, and they were so strict, you know, in those days, 
visiting hours was da 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 da. Well, there's no way we could visit her because we was playing ball. Visiting hours over, so we went and got two pieces of black material, threw over her head like somebody would not know that we weren't sisters, and crawled up the fire escape and went to her bed and turned our back to the door in case another sister came in. And there was these two sisters sitting there beside the Twilight Shiley. But anyway, we got them way with it. We crawled up the fire escape, went home the fire escape. Things like this. You sometimes didn't get away with things. Yes, that's true. Like, uh, we was always supposed to wear dresses in public, always. Well, I tried to sneak out once in a while in pants, and I'd always get caught. So there's $5, and $5 out of your paycheck was a lot of money. And if we were caught not wearing lipstick, there's another $5. You know, every time we turned around, I got fined about something. Not supposed to eat at a certain spot. Well, guess who got caught? Well, anyway, and we'd play poker, and we'd have a lot of fun. And I'd always lose in poker because it's teaching me. <laughs> And you were with real money. Your oh, yeah, real money. Yeah, you bet we were playing with real money. So let me get this straight, Maid, though. When you were growing up, the last thing you wanted to do was get in trouble with your mom and get another lick, and you'd take that castor oil. But once you're out on the road with the team, that $5 was dollars didn't bother you. Yeah, I mean, she was 2,000 miles away. I had an excuse why I spent the money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how about the chaperone? Because I thought the teams had chaperones. Oh, we did. That's who got me most of the time. She was on my case all the time. Did you like your chaperone of the night? Oh, yeah. She really took good care of us. Um, uh, she was like uh, a mother away from home. Uh, if we had any problems, you know, with our problems with girls have or anything, she was there to support us. Or if anybody got on our case, uh, she was there to give us a boost. But yeah, she gets pretty rough at times on me. You think she liked you? I think underneath she did. She had to pretend like she was. Yeah, I think she liked me. Um, I made her laugh a few times. <laughs> I bet you. And did. I had to turn her head. I know it. <laughs> now that I think about it. Yeah, you know, a lot of people's knowledge about the All-American Girls Baseball Team League was watching the movie. And of course, that one scene early in the movie where they were going through the charm school. Did you have to do that? No, that was, uh, that was only one year. And uh, believe me, we needed a little charm going on with some of us. And I was probably one of them. And um, I thought it was a good idea, but uh, I can remember one of our gals, uh, Dorothy Kavanchak, told me, she said, Mabel, here I was, up on the top of the spiral staircase, Charlie horse in my leg, high heels on, a book on my head, trying to walk down the darn stairway with this Charlie horse, and it was about to kill me, and this all over my case because I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard. It was pretty hard. I can see that. Even though you didn't have the charm school, did they still have the set of rules in terms of how you take care of yourself and how you present yourself to the public? Yes. Uh, like I said, we always had to have lipstick. Always lipstick on. And uh, no pads. Like even if it's been, like on the road trips, a lot of times we'd have pads on, but we'd have to stop, you know, for a break. We'd roll our pads up past our knees and put on an overcoat or a long coat and have to go to a little girl's room or get a Coke or something. So God behold, if that pant leg should slip down <laughs> below that coat, we'd be in deep trouble. Five dollar fine right there. When the scout came to your house and convinced your parents that this would be a great thing for you to do, I'm sure you were all ready to sign up. Oh, yeah. Was that prior to the, the uh, spring season, spring uh Yes, training? just before spring training, and I took off, and I reported to right directly to Peoria. So that's where spring training was? Yes, just, just as the season started, I wound up at Peoria. In other words, you were there for them to check out to see if you are really up to the Right. Master. Actually, Max, um, I went to, uh, two weeks, excuse me, I went, to, uh, before that, I went, had gone to, oh, God, let me get this all, so my mind gets all screwed up. Um, what in the heck was his name? Oh, 
God, I can't remember. But Max Carey himself uh, well, took me out there and uh, he says, okay, let me see what you got. So I threw to him, he says, you got it. So anyway, uh, he signed me Max Carey and uh, off I went to Peoria. In other words, you were signed to be a pitcher. Right. Did Not, they... No, they didn't even try out for anything else as a pitcher. Is that what you wanted to be doing? Well, if that's what they wanted me to be, that's what I wanted to be. But I, you know, I didn't uh, try out for a second. Uh, no. How good a hitter were you? Fair. I mean, I was no home run hitter, but I could sure hit the ball. I wasn't one of those power hitters. No way. Was this um, scout a scout specifically for the Peoria Red Wings or for the no, entire No, for league? the whole uh, organization. Do you know how it is that you ended up at, with the Red Wings? I think they needed ball players, a pitcher is what they needed. It's what I understood at the time they needed a pitcher. So that's why I became a pitcher. And this was your first time away from school or from home? Mama, yeah, first time away from Mama. In fact, she had me so spoiled, I couldn't hardly comb my own hair at the time, and I was so scared. When I went back there, um, they put me up in a hotel room first. I think it was, is there a hotel by, Jeff, is it Jefferson Hotel, if I remember correctly? I can't remember the name of the hotel there in Peoria. Um, put me up there, and I was so scared, being away from home, I pushed, because uh, I was scared of the dark. Um, uh, chairs and everything up against the door, and I had two or three baseballs in my hand in bed, and if anybody entered that door, I was going to wham them. <laughs> now, isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> Does that make sense? No, but it did to me. Well, maybe if there were some rambunctious boys in the same Well, darn it, I didn't know any then. <laughs> my roommate what? was a uh, Cuban when, I, when they put, the next day they took me over to this home and uh, what in the heck was, Ru uh, Gloria Ruiz was my roommate there in Peoria. Did she speak English? Uh, very broken, very broken. We had about, uh, I think there were six Cubans in the league, uh, and, and Gloria was one of them. Did they have any African Americans playing in the league? No, none whatsoever, and that's a shame. But if you remember, did you see the movie? There's that one scene where this the black they sort girl of put feels, through the ball. Yeah, she could throw it, but we didn't have any Jackie Robinsons. No, but which is shame. Speaking was, of Jackie Robinson, I got Sharon Robinsons on my bat here. Wasn't it 1948 that he broke the color barrier? Wasn't it that first year? It was right in that area. I don't know in the year. And the branch I can't took remember. that huge risk. Oh, he did. He took a big risk just like they took the risk for putting the girls out there on the field. But uh, it was a great risk, and if Major League Baseball would just come around today and support us, we could have a league of our own again, which we're working so hard for here in Rockford, because this is where logically it should be, right? Absolutely. We want, we want Rockford to be the Williamsport for women's baseball, just like Williamsport is. Why shouldn't it be? Well, uh, let me for the whole my, world, Rockford, where it started. Let me Women's prove my baseball. ignorance here. What's the Williamsburg connection? What's Williamsport? The, that's yeah. where the Little Boys World Series, Little League World Series is held every year. Williamsport. Okay. And it's quite famous all over the world because the, these teams come from all over the world to play at Williamsport. Uh, tell me, let's get into the main uh, the, the season then. Did you travel a lot with the team? Yes, I did. Uh, we traveled uh, in the bus. Uh, I got injured uh, with my leg. I couldn't run. I couldn't feel the butt. So I couldn't uh, play that much. But we traveled from uh, city to city. It'd be all night. And, uh, and sometimes we had uh, bus problems. Uh, but we always made it, and sometimes we would get in early to, uh, uh, and the rooms wouldn't be ready, and that would be pretty rough on us. You say you got injured. What I had happened? Charlie Horse. Charlie Horse, I couldn't even move. It was so bad. 
And, and that was kind of a permanent well, thing, a long-term thing? Yeah, it was a long-term with me, but for some reason it wouldn't heal. So they kept hoping and they kept going, but every time I did get back out there, I'd pull the darn thing again. I don't know what happened, but that's what happened. How many games did you actually play? I actually played in one. One game? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that game. Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, I had a wonderful time. I don't know what it was. I Starting can pitcher? No, I came in because they wanted to see how they had. And uh, when the first time I got there, it was Cal on first base. I can remember. I forgot what in the world I was doing out there because I was excited. Well, the time I got through doing my Dizzy Dean wind-up, that girl was standing on third base, you know, and I, oh my God almighty, Maybell, what in the world's wrong with you? <laughs> Died right there on the spot, you know. <laughs> Well, that's but after the, that, I got out of my problems. Well, that's about the time the manager might come out and have Whoa. words to say with you. I looked over at him. He gave me the look, and I thought, uh-oh. Yeah, I think he realized what had happened, that I just forgot. I did. I wound up. You have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know if she got on third, but I know she got on second. But I would say I'm, I wound up long enough where she could have been on third. But I, I think I stretched that a little bit. I don't know. It could have been. I can't remember. Hmm. How'd you pitch after that? Real good. No problem at Watso. I had a shortstop. Uh, was one of the greatest. Uh, Rita Bullering. God, she was good. She saved one hit for me. Did that girl who was on base when you started, she make it home? Oh, you bet she did. Oh, she did. So she scored on I think she did. Now, I don't know if she did or not. I, I, truthfully, I, I can't remember. Do you remember how many innings you ended up pitching? I can't remember. I think I went in in the, uh, I think I went in in the second inning. I think I finished the game. Oh. I think I finished the game. Well, for most and then, people. And then we went out for practice uh, uh, the next day or so, and I pulled my leg that you can't believe. I'd had it. What's going through your mind when that happens? Oh, I was devastated, naturally. Absolutely devastated. So I would actually I went on the DL list and uh, stayed there. And then I, I, they had me ready, and I was out warming up and trotting around, running. And damn thing, I didn't pull it again. I don't know what happened with my muscles, and to this day, I still have a problem with my leg. When they put you in the DL, does that mean they can bring somebody else up to replace you? Or well, not? they didn't. Uh, uh, I would just sat there. It's got to be awfully frustrating to sit there and know to you. tell me it was bad. But as long as I got my fifty-five dollars and two dollars traveling money, I didn't care. <laughs> I was still with the team. I was with my friends. And you still got an occasional fine that whittled down that fifty-five. They'd dollars. always get me because now I was really susceptible to fines. Okay, I know that when they first started playing girls baseball that it wasn't really baseball it was more softball that they yes started definitely with. it was softball can you kind of lay out the evolution of the game okay it started off in 1943 strictly uh softball and they called it baseball but it was actually softball and uh about 1946 it's in a Coming to this way, they, they started the sidearm that they could come sidearm, and then in '47 they started throwing the baseball style. And, and no longer any no, sidearm. No, no more sidearm. Well, they could throw sidearm if they wanted to, but it was strictly anyway. It was overhead. It was no base. Yeah. So the velocity. Yeah, was there the velocity when doing was overhead. different. The bases got longer. I can't remember now. The different sizes, and the balls got smaller as we went on. The, uh, the balls were smaller, was that make it for a livelier game? Or? Oh yes, we, you know, we, now we're beginning to play baseball, so naturally you're not going to throw a softball overhead. So the balls got smaller and smaller and smaller until the regular size. And how about the distance I think for there the was five fan? different 
Yeah, I saw that he had a chart. I think it was five. If I had a chart. Mistaken. It was amazing to see the, the different the sizes. Yes, of the ball uh, and the, the different lengths of the, the bases. The ball yeah, and the, and the pitching mounds and everything. It, it just got smaller. I can't remember sizes and everything. Were you pitching in the same distance that the pros would be? Yes. Pitching? No, no, not the uh, no, no, no. So shorter distance. No, we were always shorter distance than the pro. Well. I, you know, I'm certainly no expert on baseball, but I would think that's a whole lot less time for the batter to respond to the baseball coming Well, through. that's true, too, but, of course, we don't throw as hard as a man. Do you know roughly how fast you were throwing the ball? I have no clue because we didn't have the guns. No guns. I had no idea. What was your best pitch? It was the fastball. No one, Ryan, had nothing on me. <laughs> You believe that, don't you? <laughs> sure. I love Nolan Ryan. Right. I had I had two favorite ball players, and that was Sandy Colfax. I got him on my bat, and Nolan Ryan, which I've loved dearly. I met him in uh, Cooperstown, and uh, I just love him to death. He was so sweet. But you didn't get a signature, huh? Oh, I got you yeah, not on my back because I didn't have it. But if I saw him today, he'd sure give it to me. Because we got, got, got to know him fairly well with him and his wife, Ruth. Did you have a good curveball? It was fair, not oh, exceptionally, but it curved. Maybell, did you ever put anything on the ball? <laughs> Would you believe I wouldn't do a thing like that? <laughs> no, 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 but... Um, you know, I get so tickled about people saying, well, they're stealing the signs. Of course they're stealing the signs. That's part of the ball game, you know. And it, it, it throws me, you know, oh, they're out there stealing. Well, of course, that's, that's part of the ball game to me. Well, let's talk about another part of the ball game. What do you think of the uniforms that you had? Ah, I love the uniforms. I got that uniform on, and I thought I was the cutest thing that God ever made. And, you know, I looked at myself 40 minutes before I went out on the field. Not really. But anyway, uh, they, they were no problem whatsoever. Uh, the only thing that uh, was bad about the uniforms is we didn't have sliding pads. And uh, wound up with strawberries and still digging out gravel out of the rear ends, you know, out after all these years. Uh, we had a strawberry, you didn't quit. You, the, in, in our league, you just kept playing. It's like not like today a Major League Baseball breaks his fingernail and he's on the DL list for six months. We played. We had to play. Broken fingers and everything. So a strawberry wasn't going to slow you down. Oh, but never. Charlie never. Horse. Charlie Horse, you can't run. Did you make it especially on base? When you're, especially when you're a pitcher, you have to come off that mountain. You can't. You just can't do it. Yeah. It's so much about the, the form and velocity, isn't it? Just cannot do it. That uh, game that you did play, did you make it on base? Do you remember? Yeah, I think I walked a couple of times. I wasn't stupid. Why stand there? Because it's hard for uh, use your head. You know, you got to throw three strikes before you. I mean, uh, three strikes for you. You know, four balls. And if you already got one on you, use your. I played the game to with them. You made them work for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you remember if the team won that game where you pitched? I think so. I think we won. I'm not for sure. I'm not going to bet on it. But I think we won. But I, I think, yeah, I think Slats, or was it Dancer? I think, I think we won. Okay. So you had that disappointing season. Did you stay with the team the entire season? Yes, I stayed the season and then uh, I went home uh, and they sent a contract with me and I got it home. Uh, no, I didn't. I gave it to Jan and Denise for their program. And uh, let me come and be sure and get back there and get my leg healed. But uh, I was offered um, a position or I couldn't go back. So I stayed home and I earned my... Thank God I did. I saw in the article that was on the internet about you that you played softball a couple years. Yeah, I played softball. I played, um, oh yeah, I played um, uh, professional softball 
And I also um, uh, played for the New Orleans Jacks champions. I don't know if you ever heard of the New Orleans Jacks. I had not. The first one I, that was mentioned was the Chicago Cardinals softball Yes, game. that I did. Was that uh, a semi-pro team? No, that was a professional team. At the time, oh, God, I get so confused. We're only talking, what, 56, no, 70 years removed from some of this. Yeah, and uh, I'm not getting complete dementia, but I got a little. Um, uh, 1947, uh, they had uh, the professional softball team and uh, the professional baseball te team, the National and the American League. And I went back and played second base for... Uh, the Cardinals, and uh, I played for the New Orleans Jacks. So you're not pitching for them? No. And did you Second have the same face. problem with the leg? No, not then. How did you enjoy that? Loved it. I, you know, I just, anything to do with the ball in my hand, I'm happy. If it's softball or baseball, but I prefer the baseball. Mm -hmm. Was there as much attention that was paid to the softball league as there was to the... the oh, program? yes. In fact, they think they outdrew them sometimes. Most of the times, in fact, the softball team did there in Chicago. Where were you playing in Chicago? Uh, at um, uh, Bidwell and uh, Bluebird Park, which was owned by um, uh, the guy that owns the um, Arizona football team. Bidwell. Okay. Charlie Bidwell owned it. Real nice guy. And his two sons, who owns the Bidwell now, were out there um, uh, helping their father, you know, shag balls and all that for us when we was having out there. He'd bring them out to the ballpark, and one of them was the owner of the Bidwell the Cardinals today. How much were you getting paid when you are playing softball? I think I got, uh, oh God. Fifty-five dollars. About the same then. About the same they paid. As far as your dad was concerned, was it okay that Maybell's playing softball instead of baseball? Oh yeah, as long as his daughter was playing, he was happy. He would travel a hundred, he would go without meals to be able to have me play baseball, any type of ball. Did he see you play a lot of games? Uh, softball he did, never a baseball game. He uh, never went back with me, or he just, he'd follow me these little town teams, you know. No, oh, that's my daughter, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, the typical father. You know, if I struck out, it was because um, uh, something got in her eye or something, you know, that type thing. Or that wasn't really a strike. That umpire can't see a thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Do you have daughters? No. Well, I oh, one okay. She was a swimmer. Oh, swim. Okay. Same thing. Something went wrong, or her arm went wrong, or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you had a soft spot for your dad all the way through this. Oh God, yes. My dad was wonderful. He uh, he would have given me everything as long as I would play. You talked about this a little bit, but I wonder if you can kind of paint me more of a picture of what life on the road was like for you. You mean on the bus? On the bus. Well, we'd get on that darn bus, and uh, out would come the suitcases, out would come the cards on the bus I was on, and we'd play poker. What kind of poker? Well, it would be about... Uh, nickel a hand you know or you know whatever where's playing five card stud or seven card stud or draw or we didn't get into the fancy games they have now it was either uh five card stud or seven card stud simple games were you good at playing poker well i lost a little money <laughs> let's put it that way we had a couple of card sharks on there but um, I, I was fair Sounds like you might not have had a good poker face. Well, I, I don't think so, but I do like the slot machines now. Ah. But uh, that's what we'd do, and we'd sleep and uh, uh, sing, and uh, uh, just what anybody does on a bus when they're together, you know, just have a lot of fun. We're tired and angry, because a lot of times after a ball game, 
hop right on the bus, had our clothes and all ready to go, and off we go to the next city. And uh, like I said, some of the times the rooms weren't ready for us, we'd have to wait around for an hour or two mm -hmm. before we could get to our rooms. And I can remember, <laughs> did I tell you that story? About, it, it was, in, where was it? That was in Fort Wade. Yes, oh, Fort Wade. Fort Wade, I think it was. Yeah, Fort Wayne or South, no, Fort Wayne. We went in there and uh, one of our friends uh, knew the gal that was on the desk, one of the ball players. He says, oh, the rooms are gone. She says, well, oh, I think the suite's ready to go, but it's not clean or anything, but you just go in there and relax, you know. Oh, wonderful, just the two of us, you know, her friend and me. So I thought, oh, God, this is wonderful opened the darn door and this man was running around in there in his shorts he hadn't left yet and she didn't realize it and oh my god we ran behind a couple of uh, she he, she ran around the couch i went over on this big easy chair in those days and i sat there and every time i could peek around the car he never did know we were there and he finally put on his pants and his shirt and away i said oh god i hope he didn't do anything else you know but anyway this is what happened can you believe that I'll never forget that as long as I live. <laughs> oh, God, and I can remember one time, I don't know where we were, we called it the iron room, the brass room, the, iron, the brass room, I guess it was, because we had to go up the bed spot. Old brass bridge, you know, two of them. And I went in there and I got on this darn bed, and the damn thing went clear to the floor, you know, me and on top of it. And my roommate, oh, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I says, don't tell anybody, I don't care, I'm soft, I'm, no, I'm gonna tell. So here the big mouth went, and she told, oh, Van Orman Hotel, and that Mr. Van Orman himself came up. And, uh, yeah, Van Orman Hotel, that's what it was. And uh, Van Orman came up, uh, chaperone came up, the manager came up, everybody came up, and I said, I could have killed you, because, you know, Anyway, we got the bed situation. I could have went to sleep there just as easy, right on the floor. I'd care. But here I had all this attention and screaming and carry it on. And it was really, I'll never forget that either. Those are the two things on the road that I'll remember. Maybe though, I'm doing my math here real quick. You started playing in 48, and then you were doing the soft bottom serve. You're back I'm on all, the road I get all screwed up. You would have been 21 in 1948. You would have been of legal drinking age. Were you drinking? I never, on the road? Dr I never drank until we all had a day off, and we went to uh, the sand dunes in Indiana. The great sand dunes, right there on Lake Michigan. Yeah, and they had this little tavern up on the hill sort of from where we were and we were going to we had the day off so we had the night off and anyway or, no, we didn't have to play ball that night but we uh, well anyway went to the tavern and um there were some girls that lived in um, st louis played on the team or anyway they had what is known a game as the cardinal puff You'd sit down and you'd do this and you'd do that. And if you didn't do it exactly, you had to have a sip. You probably know something about something like that. Well, anyway, it kept going, going God, that looks, here I am, <laughs> God, that looks fun. You know? I said, well, I'll have one, you know. And that began my drinking. Yeah. And I really did that cardinal puff. And, oh, my God, I'll never forget it. And I went back to the park and I was half looped. And Chaperone knew about it, I guess, and so I got another five dollars. So anyway, that's what happened. That's why I got started drinking. Cardinal Puff, they called it. I'll were never forget the, that. Yeah, were any of the girls smoking? Yeah, oh yeah. We had a few that smoked, and I never did smoke. Never did. That was in the age though when a lot more women started to smoke during oh, the yeah. two era. Uh huh. No, we had a few that smoked, and uh, I didn't believe in smoking. Never did and never will. I didn't believe in drinking until they started there, because I came up like, a, you know, the Christian family. Mm -hmm. 
How was the food on the road? Uh, uh, while we were uh, traveling? Yeah. We? Oh, just the same old routine, the hamburgers. In fact, they had a, a place called Fight Castle back here someplace. Uh, they did a little hamburgers. I think you got 12 of them for about so much. And they had a lot of chili. We made a lot of hamburgers, a lot of chili, I remember. And uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, uh, things like that. That's what I lived on. Nothing fancy, but probably. Oh, no, no. No, it was always mostly hamburgers, hot dog. Well, at the ballpark, you'd always get a hot dog after the game, you know. And was your home. mom a good cook? My mother was the greatest cook that ever lived. And um, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not kidding. And uh, she could cook. And the one thing that I missed after she died was her chicken and dumplings and fried chicken. In other words, you missed your mom's home cook meals on the road. Oh, absolutely. There's, I couldn't eat their food because they didn't know how to cook it. My mother was a wonderful cook, absolutely. Were you able to keep in touch with the family when you were on the road? Oh, yes. I would uh, get my telephone, you know, stop at a pay phone or the hotel and call her, or at the house where I lived. So they had a, they had a, a phone in the house? Yes, where I lived. I would imagine, though, during your, the years you're growing up, that would have been a, a big luxury to have. A oh, home. it was. After I uh, uh, got uh, uh, back there, Mom and Dad got the phone because they wanted to know that their little daughter could get a hold of them, you know, without sending a telegram real fast, and our, our letter takes too long because they were worried about me. Because California to here was a long, you know, I, we went by train. That's a world apart from California. Tell me by train, my God. My, back east, they had never been past uh, Texas, you know, in their lives. And once they moved to California, Texas is it. The only place they ever traveled to is Texas and California. I wonder if you have any memories that are connected with the fans. Yeah, because at one time, um, uh, this gal, uh, folks had box seats, and somehow they latched onto me and, as, as their uh, favorite ball player. And um, they were especially fond of me, and they'd always want to take me out to dinner. I, had, I was went to their home and ate uh, uh, you know, several meals with them. And then their son um, owned an electric company, a lighting company in uh, California. And they got me in touch with him. I think it was called Grace Lighting, if I'm not mistaken. And so that was wonderful. In other words, they were busy matchmaking for you. Well, he was too old. He was no. older than me. Was this in Peoria? Well, this is where I met them. But yeah. the sun was in California. Um, a lot of the places you were going, I would imagine the the stadiums were much more intimate than the big league baseball uh, oh, stadiums would have been. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you were closer to the fans and uh, all of that. And, uh, they were very nice, and actually they was for their home team. Uh, but they treated us good. What happens if uh, a young man in the stands decided he wanted to go out on a date with you? He would have to go through the chaperone, you know, see if it was okay. And uh, it was generally okay. I, I get so tickled at Shirley about, <laughs> did she tell you about that? She mentioned a couple times. I, I, I got so tickled at that story of, of hers about uh, didn't want to marry her. You know, he just wanted to go out with her. Well, which is true. Well, they came up and asked, you know, if we could come home uh, to their homes with them. And we would, you know, my chaperone let me. Did you have a chaperone when you were playing softball as well? No, I did not. It was just in the All-Americans. So when you go to a place and the boys are interested in going out with the dates and you're playing softball, you don't have to go through the chaperone? No, I didn't have to. But if you wanted to go out with them, you could. But I was very careful because uh, uh, we know we had another game to go and we were on the traveling and we had to, you just didn't do it. You didn't have time, truthfully time you practiced and uh, it just didn't have time. In other words, you generally had a good excuse to say no. Exactly. 
Okay. Tell me about playing down with the Jacks in New Orleans. That's well, I didn't go to New Orleans to play with the Jacks. I didn't go down there. They were, at that time, I was um, um, working with uh, Northrop Aircraft, and um, they came up to California on a, a, a road trips, and they caught me and asked me what I please, please go with them. And I said, yeah. But let me see if North. First of all, I got to see if Northrop will give me the time off because I do not want to jeopardize that. So I went to my boss, and he said, "Maybell, you go." So I did. So I went with the uh, New Orleans Jacks to um, up through uh, Canada and around through Canada, Washington, Oregon, uh, uh, California, Arizona. Uh, where else did I go? Someplace else. Anyway, and then I had to get back to work. Everywhere but New Orleans. Every, I never did get to New Orleans with them, no. Hmm. I wonder if you think back on those days, especially doing all that traveling, both when you were playing baseball and on the softball teams, was there a real sense of camaraderie among the girls that you were playing with? Oh, absolutely. Um, um, still uh, uh, friends with a lot of them. In the All-Americans, you didn't be able to uh, socialize as much. Uh, but in the um, National League or with the um, New Orleans Jacks, yes. Um, became very good friends and were friends with them for years. And I've lost so many of them now. Uh, it's a shame because at my age, uh, there's not that many of us left that played baseball or softball during those years. Uh, it's, it's it, we got to accomplish so much while I'm on this side of the grass because I got to see it happen, and uh, I got to get, got to help develop the position where these girls will be able to have the same chance that we had to have the league of their own. Because it means so much to you, it gave me so much confidence, and um, I had confidence, but it just materialized it, I would say. Nothing could defeat me. And to this day, I feel the same way. I fell and broke my hip, and they uh, replaced it just about a year ago, two years, two years ago now. I just, and that's why I'm having to decay, because I was uh, like a Cracker Jack still. But uh, now I'm tired. Uh, because I had been going through rehab, and uh, and I realized I, not one of those eight out of ten that die, you know, with my age that die when you break your hip and have to have it replaced, and I was very fortunate there. But I, that wasn't going to stop me, and to this day, it's not going to stop me until I can get this done. Well, that's because you're tough. I am tough. And you've had all that experience. Yeah, I'm tough. And. You're in a pretty elite group. There was only a few hundred who ended up doing what you did. You know, I was, uh, you know, Mark, I, I, I thank God every day I live that I've had the opportunity to be able to do what I have done in my life. And I'm not sorry for one moment. There's a couple of times I think back what I could have done better uh, as far as my parents go, because when you're growing up, Sometimes you don't realize the sacrifices the families make until you get older. And then sometimes it's too late. Uh, there's a couple of things I know now I could have done better, and I'm very sorry for that. But the rest of my life, I have been very fortunate, very happy, and I want to give back now things that I was able to accomplish. From what you talked about in growing up, it sounds like both of your parents sacrificed a lot and they would have done it all over again had they had the same opportunity. Absolutely, and maybe more, but I don't know how they could have given me more because they didn't have any more. They gave me all they had. I'd like to spend a, give you a couple moments to talk about your working career, and you've already talked about it a little bit, but tell us what you did beyond baseball and softball. Well, I uh, very fortunate, like I told you, got a job at Northrop Aircraft. And uh, this man, I don't know, he must have saw something in me. I don't know what, 
But anyway, he saw something in me. And I think he realized that maybe there was a place in uh, the world for women to be able to get ahead. And he wanted to be a part of that. That's the way I look at it today. And because he told me, he says, Mabel, I want you to come work for me. And I do believe I will be able to make you a manager of North of Paracraft. And I said, oh, again, I couldn't believe it. And I said, you know, when there isn't, you know, women managers in, in the aircraft industry, uh, it's men, they're coming home from the war and everything. I, yeah, I, and and he says, there. no, I really now, I really mean this. And so I said, okay, I'm going to give it a try. And because uh, I knew that that would be going on. And uh, so I did, I went into highway transportation and uh, I learned uh, <coughs> every trick of the trade. I first became um, a courier where I would drive a car and go pick up the generals and the VIPs and bring up to Northrop for meetings and so forth. And from there, I went into, uh, when I wasn't doing anything, he wanted me to go in and sit by the dispatcher. Uh, you know, I didn't have an assignment to go in and sit by the dispatcher, take calls and all of this and give it to the dispatcher, which I did. And then when the dispatcher had to get out and uh, go on a break and so forth, I'd take over dispatching. Before long, I became the dispatcher and then we kept growing and we had another dispatcher, there was two of us. And then he says, okay, he says, now it's time for you to go out and learn how to drive the equipment. So I did. I drew, drove uh, everything from uh, semis, 16 wheelers, to uh, cranes, forklifts, baddies, what they call baddies, it goes into the um, manufacturing sections of the aircraft, pulling little trailers behind, dropping off their supplies and what have you. I learned everything about it. And uh, he f said, Mabel, you are ready. And I says, for what? And he says, you're going to become a manager. I says, you're kidding. And he said, no, he says, you're going to be the supervisor of transportation. So I said, oh my God. So anyway, I became manager and the guys couldn't frown on me because he, they knew I knew what I was doing. And um, I was very fortunate that I got to hold of uh, highway transportation. I was manager of that. And then he turned me over and I got to be in, in internal transportation. And also and I had about 185 people working for me. And, and I had about maybe eight or 10 girls of, of that was girls. Some of them were the couriers going out picking up the VIPs, the others secretary and so forth. And any, I was very, very fortunate. Any problem with some of the guys who resented that you were a woman manager over them? No, because they do. When I said the word, I meant what I was saying. And uh, they knew better. And um, they knew I knew what I was talking about. They couldn't pull the wool over my eyes. Uh, I'm curious, sir. Er, er, not sure about one thing. You're working for Northrop, an aircraft manufacturer, but you're doing managing for a highway transportation? Well, if you realize it was Northrop's highway transportation. Okay, their own in terms their of own, we, it's our own. It's our own transportation. You have no idea what takes place at an aircraft factory our size. We had to haul rivets, toilet paper, this, that, everything. Anything you mentioned, we hauled. And we hauled parts of airplanes from um, Hawthorne to Palmdale where the assemble sub, the final assembly would be up there because they'd then fly them away from, Palm, uh, from uh, Palmdale. Any of these aircraft that I would recognize? You better believe it, the F-18 today, the B B-2 bomber. Wow. Yeah, I um, was very fortunate. Oh gosh, people still don't believe this. But um, I was the one that got the F-18. Well, at that time, it was called the F-17. It was having a fly off with um, the F-16 between the two uh, aircraft for the uh, Air Force. 
So we had to test them out. So I was responsible of getting the F-17, which was our aircraft, to Palmdale with the wings on it and all of this. And I had to plan the route and get that aircraft up to uh, Edwards Air Force Base for the fly-off. And you can't imagine the power and the excitement and the nerves that ran through me. I had to tear down, uh, I had to measure every cockeye bridge and say it was 17 this and or that or whatever the dimension was. But they forget that uh, there was air in tires or, or we had to lower the air in the tires to get this through and we had to measure everything's tear down signs, uh, get on that freeway, stop the traffic. Uh, it was quite a move. I think I had 35 men and me taking that aircraft from plant protection to uh, our engine transportability, uh, their, our uh, radio system to uh, uh, first aid, uh, everything to get that aircraft to uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And when we got to Edwards Air Force Base, they had the red carpet rolled out for us. And I can remember getting out of my truck, pickup truck, the kid was, I was leading the parade, telling them, you know, move over to the left a little, move to the right. Uh, Aircraft, uh, the band was standing there, Air Force band playing, off we go in the well. And I got out of my, I couldn't hardly stand, my legs buckled under me. It was such a thrill mm. and such a relief. I could just feel it. This is the kind of thing, you're, you're allowed to make zero mistakes, right? Honey, there couldn't have been a mistake. And then we got up there and um, Unfortunately, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, um, the Air Force decided they wanted the uh, 16, but the Navy wanted the 17 to build into the 18, which McDonnell Douglas then built. That's what I was thinking. I thought the, Air, the Navy had picked the, this The up. Navy took the aircraft. Our F-18 is what the Navy flies. And I did that. Maybe oh, they can't take that one they away They can't from. take that away from me. I'll never forget it. And I probably, probably one of the very few girls that was ever lucky enough to, with the B-2 bomber, to sit in a simulated flight uh -huh. before it took off. It's a thrill that you'll never end. You feel like you're flying in it. Because I started planning the movement of the B-2 bomber to, uh, the Air Force Base, but then that's when I retired. But we had the cockpit all ready to go. What year was it that you retired? 1986. After how many years working for Northrop? 37. That's a good career in anybody's measure. Isn't that something? I was so fortunate. I was the most luckiest girl in the world. Now I gotta give back. I wanted to ask a few more questions that takes us back to sports in general and yes. baseball in particular. Uh, 1954 was the last year they played yes. All-American Girls Baseball. What were you feeling when you knew that the league was failing, that it was going to end? Well, I could see. Uh, it's one thing, I have a pretty good um, um, perception about seeing what's happening. I knew the war was over. Uh, I knew that the guys were coming back, the great ball players was coming back. Uh, the Maggios, the Ted Filler, you know, all of them were coming back. And I could see the attendance was starting to drop off in the stands. You could see it coming. And eventually it was going to happen. And it did happen. Actually, basically, it really, I, in my mind, ended probably the good stuff about 19, that, this is strictly, don't put this on record, about 1951, I would say, was about the end of it. When they start having the girls travel, you knew it was gone. You knew it. Still, there's got to be a little bit of the sadness on you. Yes, part. it was. It was very sad. When, when it started happening, I was... Uh, very devastated because it was something that the girls had of our own. And, and we didn't have anything to speak of. And thank God, Title IX came through with the help of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. 
That was my very next question. That was 1972 that Congress passed Title IX, and you saying there was a direct connection between... I do believe, yes. It's a, a fact that we were a direct combination to, towards Title IX. And um, I can remember I was a guest speaker there in uh, California, Southern California, for the... Um, uh, was, uh, what did they do? It's called Federation of All of the Women's Athletic Departments of California. I was a speaker for the women that stood up, the coaches uh, that uh, demanded that the women have their rights. Uh, God, I don't know what year that was, and I can't remember the name of the thing. Anyway, I was the, um, and Ann Drysdale um, Myers introduced me. Uh, and I was, I guess, I can't remember the name of it, for those women that put their jobs on the line, those athletic directors put their jobs on their lines for Title IX. And this opened the door for all the women now to be able to be what they're doing and establish what's happening today. And it just blew my mind. And it was started with the All-Americans. 19. They gave a lot of it to Billie Jean King, don't get me wrong, yes, but was it for us, Billie Jean King wouldn't be as well as she would have been. And the impact that Title IX has had on the country, how would you, just, how would you describe that? Fantastic. You see uh, women CEOs, you see women all over the map, in, in different positions. We not only school teachers now, and, and nurses, we're everything, we're the doctor or this, or that. And it's still opening up the doors for us and opening up, just like, just like today, for instance, in the NBA, there's a woman a, a referee. In, in FL, there's a, a referee, right? Do you see one in Major League Baseball, which actually is easier for an umpire than running up and down the field like they have to run and do all this? A woman can see as good as you guys, Right? We got eyes. You think that we don't know the rule book? Backwards and forwards. So why can't we be an umpire? You don't think there'd be ladies that wouldn't mind having the, the manager get in their face and kicking dust on their shoes? Are you out of your mind? No way. <laughs> You're out of there, boy. You're out. Don't fool around with me. And right now we have two women in the umpire business, uh, minor, 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 minor leagues. One just got in, a young uh, gal from Minnesota. Uh, her name's Emma Chat Charles Chatworth, one of the nicest gals in the world. And uh, she wants to be a major league umpire and she should have the chance uh, if she's good enough. I don't want a girl to go in there if she's not good. No way. I mean, we got to be as good as that. Well, why can't we? We can see as good as you. How about allowing women to play on the team? No. Uh, my feeling is there will never be a woman capable because we are not strong enough. We can't run as fast, even our greatest runners. You can see how they just can't. We can't. We'll never be able to hit the ball as hard or throw as hard or run as fast. No, no possible way. Just like in basketball. You don't see a girl playing uh, um, uh, basketball with the boys. No. But there's no reason they shouldn't have a league of their own? There is no reason why we can't have a league of our own again and play the game that we love, not pushed into softball like they do. Like the girls come up to us and say, where are we going? We can't play baseball. This is their love of their life because we gotta be pushed into softball. Hmm. I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the other things that happened after Title IX. 1982 is another big year. Uh, the creation of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League Association. There's a mouthful. Were you involved with that? Uh, no, uh, it was just a very few girls uh, that was involved in that. And I know that um, 
Jane Moffat and uh, Karen Conkle and a few, and Darling Wiltz and June Pippas. There's about five or six of the girls that got together and organized that. Then they had their first reunion, our, our first reunion, I think it was in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. But then it just took off, then we were all for one again. And sounds like you were proud and happy to join as soon as you had a chance. Oh, absolutely. Um, I haven't missed a reunion since. And thank God the dear old Lord has taken good care of me. In fact, I have put, Shirley and I have put on four reunions ourselves. What was the association's mission? What is its mission? To preserve um, uh, the legacy of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Were you involved when Cooperstown opened up that exhibit in 1988 for the women's yes, baseball? Yes, uh -huh. was right there and uh, uh, was uh, uh, quite exciting. Uh, and then uh, we had a parade later on, I can't remember what year that was, uh, all through Cooperstown. It was, well, that had been too many years ago. I don't know how many years ago. But it was absolutely uh, outstanding. Um, it was uh, something that uh, was needed. I do not believe that we should uh, have individuals, in my opinion, in there because we are not major league baseball players. We are not the great ball players that they are, but we should have our own where we could have our best ball players in it, our stars, and, and not only in the United States, but from all over the country. We have over 21 countries now playing uh, women's professional, uh, not professional baseball, but baseball, including Pakistan. Can you believe that Even one? Pakistan. Even Pakistan. Hmm. Even Pakistan. Your emphasis on not having individuals but the team that's very much the emphasis of that initial exhibit in Cooperstown. Isn't right, it? that's the way it should be. Because that museum to me belongs to those great guy ball players. Don't get me wrong, our girls are great in their league. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I do not, in my heart, some of the girls believe they, we should have girls there. I don't because if we are capable of making that Major League Baseball team and earning our right to be on that wall with Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and whatever, that would be wonderful. But we do have the right to have that wall with the girls that made the great history. Those were the trailblazers. That's right. We should have them on our own wall, our Hall of Fame. And that's what we should have, and that's what I'd like to see built here in, in Rockford, where it all started from, uh, to have a league of our own and our own museum and our own Williamsport, I'm going back to Williamsport, for women, right here, the heart of baseball. It can be for the whole world, right here in Rockford. Let's, since you just mentioned our league of our own, let's talk about the movie, 1992. It seems kind of strange. We're 25 years beyond that. But tell me about whether or not you were even associated with the movie at all at that time. Uh, yes. Um, I was home and they sent me a, a letter, you know, that they were going, they're filming this movie. So naturally, uh, I grabbed the chance and I, they flew me in. And so I um, uh, was involved in it. I'm in it at the, uh, the credits. And the beginning, you know, when the Dottie came out to the ballpark, and uh, little, if you blink, you can't see me, but I've been in several different little synopsis there. But it was fun. There was, um, I think there was 48 of us that was uh, there making of that movie. Did you act as a consultant at all? Uh, no. No, I did not. How? How well did they do in depicting what the game was like and what the uh, feeling was like? What you saw on, in the movie, I would say, is 90% correct. Uh, the only thing that uh, wasn't fact was uh, 
uh, the Hollywood stuff, her doing the splits and the catching of the hat and, and him coming into the girls' locker room. Uh, man was, manager was never allowed into the woman's locker room, period. Chaperone would always get us and take us to his office uh, if he wanted to talk to us or individually, I uh, mean, together, then we would, you know, be in the dugout or whatever, but never was he allowed into that. And uh, the chaperone uh, made her look like a little, uh, not well enough. That's another thing that uh, bugged a few of us, uh, throwing the pie in her face and all that. Uh, that never happened. But uh, she was more like uh, a dead mother, you know, like a Boy Scout master to us. The, uh, the movie, you know, it's supposed to be 1943-44 time frame, and it looks much more like the game you and Shirley would have been playing when it converted from really more like softball to really more like baseball. That's true. You know, I never thought of that. You're absolutely right. That's the first, that's right. Exactly. That was when charm school was. That's when yeah. it started. Yeah. Oh, Pete, you're the first one that has uh, pointed that out. Really? Well, how did you do that? Well, I just read the history of your organization. But nobody and... mentioned that. I have, that's the first time, honest to God, that I have heard that analysis. Hmm. And but it's the... so true because they were throwing softball underhand. You didn't see any of that in that movie. But both you and Shirley really, really Played identify baseball. with playing baseball, baseball and yes. not softball. No, no, baseball. It was baseball. Uh, uh, I can't believe that. It's so true. Hmm. Were you there then at the end of the movie when they all went to Cooperstown? Were oh. you in that scene as well? Yes, uh-huh, sure was. So that means you got You would the... recognize me, though. My hair was a little colored. Well, I'll look really hard because I've got a copy of it at home. Okay, you look for me. And as they start to come around into the deal, into the Hall of Fame, you know, they came around the corner. Well, here was, it looked like two guys and a girl standing there. That was me, and they were coming around the corner. Uh -huh. That's one scene. Um, I imagine then you got to meet all of these big stars. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have, um, uh, I am very fortunate to, uh, uh, meet them and I'm with them uh, uh, a great deal. In fact, I went to, uh, Shirley and I went to uh, Bentonville for Gina Davis's uh, film festival. She probably told you this and it was great fun. Uh, we have met them at several other occasions. Uh, I've become very good friends with them. Um, uh, in fact, I was going to have a party on August the 19th, and I'm calling them up now and telling them to forget it because I'm too tired. I, as soon as we get home, um, we have to go to San Bernardino, I think on the 6th of, of this month, or Little League uh, playoffs, uh, big deal there in San Bernardino. They want us there, and ESPN wants us there. And then we leave for... Uh, Dallas, Texas on, uh, I think, the 12th, I don't know. Donna Cohen handles all this for us. And then we no more and get home, we have to go to uh, uh, our reunion in Cincinnati this year. And then after that, we'll come home and go to um, Washington, D.C. They want us there. And uh, from there, we go where are we going? Someplace else. In other words, you're back on the road again. Back to Florida, I think, or was it New York? I don't know. Yes, we're on the road again. We're trying so hard to let people know that we want this baseball business back. How much does it mean to you then that you have this opportunity to be an ambassador for the game? It means all the world, all the world to me. And as long as I'm on this side of the grass, I will be doing this for these girls because I know how much it meant to me and what it did for me as an individual, and I would like them to have that same opportunity. 
Did it surprise you that the movie at Le Guerrero has been so successful and is so popular even to this day? When I heard about it, I thought, nah, well, you know, uh, it's just going to be another little old movie. It'll probably be movie like they used to call it when I was a kid. Um, but my gosh, it's the most gross movie of all sports of, of all sports movies. Did you know that? It has grossed more money. I read that and Shirley told me the same thing. It, it's a fact. It, it's unbelievable to us. But you know what it is? It, it's a movie that will never outgrow itself. And it's a movie that gives these little girls hope. They have come up to me and they say, I know every word of the movie and I believe it because their mothers comes and tells me. And then when they come and grab you around the leg and tell you, thank you for the movie and oh, how wonderful it is. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. One mother came to me and she has a little team, she said, and she says, I don't like you girls at all. And I says, what's the problem? She says, well, my daughter will not go out and play baseball until I show her that movie. So I see that movie every time we have to go out and play a ball. She won't go out until she sees a movie. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I about died on that one. I, I'm wondering, you got a chance to meet these all, all these movie stars. And even back in the day, these were big movie stars. Yes. And which side of this equation were you more impressed? Were they more impressed about you as one of the original ball players, or were you more enamored with them, these big Hollywood movie stars? Well, uh, when we were in Bentonville, they were uh, on film uh, for, I don't know who it was, and like they said, if it wasn't for them pointing to us, they wouldn't be here. And vice versa. So it's a love, love for both sides because we think they did such a wonderful job in portraying us, and they thank us for a good payday. And their and their legacy does never end either because it is the most gross uh, movie of all times, and it's always playing, and their face is always out there. And I don't think it's declined at all in popularity. It's probably grown. I, th I think it's growing because the girls' baseball is growing. And uh, uh, people are getting aware now that girls do want to play. And it will never outdate itself. Never. Maybelle, I talked to a lot of people about how excited I was to come to this interview. And they always have a quote from the movie. And you know what it is. So here's my question for you as we get close to the end of this. Is there... Crying in baseball? <laughs> well, Mark, you know there is. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you sure have to admire these girls that are playing today, uh, and, and whatever. And when they get hurt, they keep on playing. And that's what amazes me. Women will continue playing. You look back at your own life. Do you have any really special memory of those years that you were involved in baseball and softball? No, because it was love from the minute I can remember. Everything was a love. Everything to me was important, putting on my shoes. And one of the things I loved best when I first was little, when I first put on my spikes, First thing I can remember was that sweet music of the steel spikes hitting the cement. Click, 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 click. Music to my ears every time I hear it. Even when I go to a, 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 an amateur game today and I hear people walk on the cement, I can hear that click, click, click. I can write a movie about, a song about, hey, click, click, click. Takes you right back, back to when you're a little it. girl again, huh? Click, click, click. Those are the sweetest words in my ears. Click, click, click. How different has your life been because you had this opportunity? It gives me a chance to uh, give back uh, to what I had. It uh, gives me the realization that other people 
need to have the same opportunity that I had, it, it does my heart a world good. It, like I told the little girls yesterday, I says, every time I see you kids out here, they all gather around me after the championship game. I says, you made, my, made me 10 years younger just to see you out here playing. And he says, well, we'll be back next year, Mabel. We'll be back next year. I says, I sure hope so, because I, you made me 10 years younger, and I'll be with you. Well, there you go. Um, I wonder, would you even have had that opportunity? It's obviously the, the experience at Northwood was very important to you as well. Would you ever have had that opportunity without the experience of baseball? No. No. Uh, baseball opened up the doors for women. I mean, all women, due to the fact of Title IX, and it has opened up every opportunity in the world for us, and it is still creating opportunities for the girls of the future. Is there something unique or special about baseball that you can't say the same thing about the girls who are playing basketball or soccer or some of the other sports? No, because it's, it's, it's uh, baseball to me is naturally the number one sport in my whole life. And I'm sure it is with the girls that are playing basketball and soccer. But if it wasn't for baseball, these girls wouldn't be out there playing in the WBPA and in all the soccer teams. And baseball opened the doors for them. This has been a gem of an interview for me, just as the talk with Shirley was this morning. How would you like to finish up our conversation today, Maybell? I'm very happy as far as we have grown, as far as the um, baseball opened the doors for girls, but I would like for the public and Major League Baseball to get in and help us develop another league of their own to give these girls the opportunity to play the game that they love, because you can go to any baseball stadium and see half of the audience are women, and women bring in the revenue because they're bringing in their children and what have you. And we need girls to play baseball and let them follow their dreams. That's what I would like to say. It's obvious you've been a great ambassador for the game. And as you said, as long as you're on the green side of this earth, you'll continue to be. I'm convinced of that. I hope so, Mark, because that's where I'm headed. I'm headed back home and I'm back on the road again. Thank you, Maybell. Hey, thanks a million.